Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. So this is a stock analysis update for Scottish and Southern Electricity. SSE are a giant electricity generation and utilities company. I was very interested in these because when I looked at investing in renewables, two of my main areas of interest were renewable energy, particularly wind power and energy storage and transmission. These were a perfect match for that. They do electricity generation and they're mainly focusing on renewable for this. And they're also a electricity utilities company with electricity transmission and then distribution. Transmissions from the power station to the local substations and then the distribution is then getting the, ele getting the electricity to everyone's house. Now, in terms of the electricity generation, actually 58% of their current generation is thermal. But you see that 36% of their generation capacity is wind power. And as I'll go into, they're currently on a very ambitious plan to treble their wind output to 30 terawatt hours by 2030. As a utilities company, they are in a monopoly situation, so they're subject to regulation by Ofgem. And there's these Rio 2 price controls, which just came into effect this new financial year. And this is a kind of a game where the company has to get together with Ofgem so many years and agree to how much investment they're going to put into the, into the electricity network. And in return for that, Ofgem tell them how much money they're allowed to make. You can see that they're capex every year. There's a lot that has to go into transmission and distribution to satisfy Ofgem. And this does then produce a steady and almost guaranteed operation, operating profit. But as you can see, they're having to put a lot in at the moment to achieve satisfaction of the regulators. And in the coming five to 10 years, it's going to be a bit of a handful upgrading the whole network to, to be able to deal with all this renewable energy that's being thrown at it, the, let alone, of course, the effect of electric cars. They are devoting a lot of money into building new renewables, and they seem to get a lot of bang for their buck in this case. So in terms of operating profit, you see that the, you see that the electricity generation does bring in a nice amount of their revenues. A lot of it is retail energy supply, despite the massive amounts that they've sold off already. But that hardly brings in, any, brings in any profit. They're actually going to sell their gas storage and production facilities next year. And that's actually 10% of their revenues at the moment. But it's barely breaking even. So when I last looked at them back in March, the story of the previous five years had been them selling off a lot of their assets because they wanted to refocus on renewables. They had this massive retail electricity sales part of the business and they sold this off, but their share price had been taking a dive along with their revenues. You can see here the effect of those divestments with their income reducing from about 32 billion to just 9 billion in 2019. Then the story was in around 2019, the, the new price controls from Ofgem and ultimately, when that was concluded, SSE was saying that it was a bad deal, but we don't know if it really is a bad deal, and that that's going to really affect their rev that's going to affect their profits from transmission and distribution in the next few years, or whether they were just saying it's a bad deal because that's all part of playing the game. So in 2020, they sold their multi fuel business for a billion, and since I did the video. They issued 500 million of green bonds and then we had the full year 2021 results. They promised to keep their dividends the same which are now 5.2% plus match any inflation so you get an amazing dividend with this company. But as you can see their price has gone up quite a bit since I did that last video. So at initial glance their results for 2021 look really good. Their income was 8 billion and their expenditure about 6 billion for an operating profit of 2.7 billion 
a net income of 2.2 billion. So that looks great, but when I actually dug into it, saw that amongst the cost of sales, there was this exceptional item, which was movement on operating derivatives. So they hedged the prices that they're going to get for their electricity, and it sold at a lower price. So they got this uh, cash back because of their hedge. They're using this hedging to keep a more constant um, revenue for their um, for their electricity electricity that they distribute. But to me, that's a slightly uneasy kind of an effect. Also, one billion of their operating income was actually divestments. It was uh, selling sell it was selling off their ferry bridge multi fuel business, plus a bit of their offshore wind farm portfolio. And also this piddly little maple smart meter company for 70 million. So when I take away all these exceptional items, their operating profit was only 1.1 billion and their net income 0.7 billion. When you look over the last five years, this company is now less profitable and it has a lower net income than used to be the case historically. But they're investing heavily into their renewables. And they won't be built for another four or five years. So you're kind of investing in the future revenues that they'll be getting from those. So that explains why the the share price maybe is approaching what it used to be, despite the lower net income. And this includes exceptional items. So it's not really so useful. And again, with my revenue graph, it's hard to tell with the scale here. But when I look at the operating profits, renewables are the majority of their operating profits, but it clearly dropped down from 2019. And their distribution and transmission are fairly stable as you expect. And this is the bread and butter money coming in from the utilities half of this company. I, I wanted to understand where these profits were going to go in the future. And the transmission was about the same as in 2020. The distribution dropped 25%. This is partly because of the COVID crisis lockdown, but also there was some effect from depreciation of their assets. This was because they're having to invest heavily in upgrading the network. And then this has, this has depreciation effects, but we could give it to them that this will jump up a bit because we're going out of lockdown. The thermals kind of so-so and renewable was down 10%. This was partly because we had less wind. The amount of wind went down 10% and it was also affected a bit by some of their previous disposals. They're having to sell off some of their existing wind assets to pay for the new ones that are building. And whenever they do this, it whittles down their revenues a bit. I went onto the government website and found the average wind speeds. In tandem with the renewables profits going down, we can see that the amount of wind was reduced. And it's currently actually this year at a lower point here. It's the purple line now, and it's below what it's ever been before. So we can actually assume low wind speeds this year too. So overall, I could expect the profit could slightly improve or be about the same as it was before, but it's not too or inspiring. Really, what's important for this company is their future growth in the renewables pipeline. I took a look at when their new wind farm projects are going to be coming online. And we can see that really it won't be until 2024, 2025, until all these projects are coming online and then they reap the rewards. And, and then by then they will be getting about a billion a year coming in, in uh, renewables operating profits. Now I must say that's a very rough estimation that I've done based on the profit they're currently making from their current renewables capacity. However, it's a good kind of rough indicator. And then I can put alongside this, their investment plan They've committed to invest 7.5 billion and 2.8 billion of that Rio2 network upgrades for their distribution and transmission business. But the rest of that 7.5 billion is building new wind farms. 
and they spent about a billion last year. They're going to spend two billion this year. And we don't know the exact timing. So the remaining the remaining 4.5 billion are distributed evenly. But this does show how they've got to go through a lot of pain now before they then get the gain from 2025 onwards. When I look at their assets and debt, you can see that the net assets are up. And this is presumably all of these new renewables projects they're building. And from the assets they've been selling off, they've now got 1.6 billion in cash, which is going to help out here. They have 8.5 billion in debt. And they've said all along that they're going to have a net debt to a bit the ratio of five. And they're, and they're on target with this. But regardless, they do have a lot of debt. And so I'm looking at their 7.5 billion capex investment plan. And it's quite clear that they can easily that they can easily pay this year's two billion just off this cash they've got, plus the normal net income they've got coming in. But then in the next two years, they'll start having to use more debt in order to pay off some of this. So I worked out they'd have to pay, you know, probably about 1.5 billion in new debt over the, over, over the subsequent three years. So this all looks, you know, this looks a bit of a stretch, but quite manageable. But let's look at the cash flow. So in 2021, they, they raised 1.4 billion from normal activities and 0.6 billion from depreciation, amortization, write downs and impairments. Now, it's a little strange that this is a positive cash flow, but how that works is all this, all this depreciation, amortization, that is actually tax deductible. So it's treated as a positive cash flow. So they have about 2 billion of positive cash flow just from the main business activities. But that barely covers the 0.8 billion dividend, 0.8 billion in dividends they're paying plus 1.2 billion in capex they played last year. They raked in 1.5 billion from their disposals and they took on unfortunately 1.9 billion of new debt last year. So this made them 5.8 billion cash positive last year. And these costs, which also included 2.2 billion in paying off debt plus 0.3 billion in interest was 4.6 billion in negative. So they had 1.4 billion positive cash flow last year, but that did include taking on about 2 billion of new debt. So if I take away these unusual things and assume that they don't take on any new debt, and then I up the amount of capex to two billion because that's what they said they're going to spend this year. This then leads to a positive 2.2 billion and a negative 3.2 billion. So they're losing a billion a year and then half a billion when the amount of capex drops down to 1.5 billion. So really where I was wavering on this one, they really are stretching things to the limit in order to achieve their Rio 2 requirements and also their renewables ambitions. And it is great that they hit right on the wind power where I want to be investing in and also hit right on the electricity transmission that I want to invest in. But it really does look like a bit of a stretch to achieve that. While, but where I was wavering at this point was that they could just about do it and it was worth doing it for the uh, the future revenues. But the one thing that was worrying me was what about the, um, you know, what about these costs and how much can we trust these costs? So I listened to their investor call that they had when they released their results. And the most interesting questions that came up were around price inflation, the raw materials. And this question which I've edited the answer a bit, so please go and listen to it yourself on their website. But it just, but but they asked three questions, so I've just limited it to the the one we're interested in, the price of copper. They actually explained that the price was locked in the wind farm projects, so we're not so worried about the costs increasing for the wind farm component. Of 
RJ Patel, Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead, your line is open. Good morning, and thank you for the presentation. It's appreciated. Um, I've got three questions, please. Um, the first one is on raw material costs. We've seen quite substantial increases. Could you walk us through uh, what exposures are hedged out and when, and where the exposures may lie? Because I, I, just to understand better sort of how that process sort of works from from the point at which you get an um, a auction win to actually final investment decision? And does that impact the returns of Dogger Bank C at all? Secondly, just on the balance sheet, like huge amounts of opportunity here, clearly, in, in what you've highlighted in the presentation. Um, and also, just changes that happened in the earlier seabed auction, sort of in regards to the fees and the requirements that has, does that change how you maybe look at leverage and what kind of capital you need for investment? And when do we have better clarity of how you fund that um, investment opportunity that you see ahead of you? Um, will that all come in the capital update later in the year, or, or do we wait later for that? And then um, finally, just very specifically, when do we hear about your dividend policy beyond 2023? Um, at least the sort of later by latest X, we would have a view here. Um, and that would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, AJ. Look, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll probably Martin will probably uh, cover the bulk of material cost increases in, in Dogger Bank C. Um, uh, I, I think we've got well worn routes to all that. Um, uh, look, I'll do dividend quickly and a little bit of balance sheet, and then Gregor can 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 maybe fill some of that in as well. Um, because that second question was quite a long one. We might all have a crack at that one, actually. Um, but uh, cool. Um, going back to um, seabed auctions and leverage and things like that, I, I suppose just, just at a high level, we're very clear that we've got the £7.5 billion pound plan. Um, we can run through in a bit more detail. If you want, Greg, I can maybe do that what additional things may be facing us over the course of the summer. Um, but we're very clear that we can fund all the things that we've got at the moment. We have uh, a very strong asset base and the opportunity to recycle capital from it if additional opportunities come our way. And um, as you'll have seen throughout the presentation, there are a number of those opportunities there. But um, Greg, it's a slightly long, complicated question, but do you want to... I, I, you know my view on this. You know, I've been in this job a long time. Having opportunities and options is a great position for utilities to be in, and, and SSCA is one of those companies that has shown that we're really progressive in how, how we partner and how we recycle capital um, into kind of value-enhancing uh, opportunities. So I think you know we will update the market uh, in uh, November. Uh, on that CapEx plan, which could include some of the transmission spend that uh, Alistair talked about, uh, some renewable opportunities. And clearly, you know, if we could get the UK government uh, put forward on pump storage, Corey Glass could be part of that, and that would be really exciting for us. Um, and we will give uh, details to the market how we fund that. Uh, I'm very optimistic that we have the capability to do that through a mixture of uh, Recycling capital and, and partnering, uh, as we've always said, and uh, uh, we're confident in that. Uh, morning, AJ. Just on your question, Dogger Bank C. Um, I mean, look, I think we're well used to building out uh, big, uh, complicated projects, and we are well used to projects having ups, ups and downs. And obviously, raw material costs have for now um, gone up. Um, uh, but equally, so has uh, the value of sterling, um, so has the value of carbon, so has um, uh, C CPI, um, RPI, etc. So th there's ups and downs in, in, in projects. Of course, there are, um, but we don't have any exposure um, for projects which we are currently in construction. Okay. Great. Sorry, Thank sorry. You. Just to be clear on that, if you just sign that last part. You said you have no exposure on assets under construction. Does that mean you do have exposure on Dogger Bank C because it hasn't had final investment so, decision? No, so, so to be clear, so, so Dogger Bank C will be facing into a higher raw materials um, context, but also will be facing into um, a strong sterling outlook and, and other things that are pretty positive for it, including kind of carbon prices on kind of, kind of commissioning loads. There's always ups and downs. They're kind of... Um, these things, uh, obviously, prices move all the time, and all that will be uh, dealt with as we go through FID. 
So, so, okay. so, so, so AJ, to answer your question, existing projects are all locked in. Dogger Bank C will have a lot of it locked in. Not everything is locked in, but as Martin said, there are ups and downs within Dogger Bank C. Um, and that's, I think, within what we normally see within projects. So I understand the question because we're in a bit of a super cycle or some sort of cycle, um, but there are ups and downs there, and some things we're benefiting from and some things we're not. Um, but we don't have any current concerns about that. Okay, very clear. Thank you very much. And in this question, I realized that they can't really control the price so much for their for, for the 2.8 billion they've got to spend on the electricity transmission network and the electricity distribution network. All right, Martin. Thank you. All right. Good. Thank you. Sharon. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Freshney from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hello. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I have three. Firstly, on um, the other cost line within the P&L, normally it's about $10 million of cost a year. It's very low. It's jumped up to $60 million or thereabout this year. And I understand there are issues with how capital gains and allocation of costs to businesses are accounted for, but perhaps, Greg, you could run through that. Um, secondly, uh, for Martin, on, on capital discipline, I mean, every, everyone who wins a project in offshore will tell you that they've been disciplined, but there's clearly some doubt on that within the industry uh, over the last year. So practically, when, when you go into projects and, 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 and tender for for contracts, how, how can we be sure you're disciplined and what, what internal processes do, do you go through? And thirdly, uh, one for Gregor on the network side, I and mean, we've spoken about you know, the commodity costs within uh, or, or, or indexation of turbine supply agreements and cable agreements, etc. But um, when, when it comes to the regulated network side, I mean, there's a lot of steel and concrete and copper that goes into your networks there. Um, what are you seeing seeing there on the input side, and is that something that is easy to mitigate? Thank you. Okay, so, so Gregor, <coughs> you just stop? Yeah, you go if you want. So I'll try and take the capital discipline <laughs> question. Um, I mean, I, look, Mark. I mean, um, what I say about this? I mean. Um, clearly, I think we've uh, exerted capital discipline in the past. I mean, obviously, we weren't successful in the last seabed auction. Um, we um, have um, highly experienced teams. We've been um, in offshore for many, many years um, and seen probably uh, the, the risks and also the upsides and the ups and downs we talked about in terms of projects. Also worth pointing out that I don't think we necessarily see an offshore project as just a kind of consent and develop and build. It's a consent, develop, engineer, build, operate, um, trade, um, take out um, and look after and mitigate the imbalance, risk, etc. I mean, it's, so it's right across the piece. And obviously, we have long established skill and expertise in that, um, which is all highly considered when we are considering um, how to um, enter new development opportunities. Um, so. No, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident our record in this space is, is, is very, very strong. Um, so, Mark, in terms of uh, the copper unallocated, uh, there are kind of a number of things in there, but the key two on the kind of two, two kind of issues I kind of comment about would be one, um, how we uh, how we deal with um, the TSAs with ovals. So, these transition down. Uh, and over time, uh, they've come down. So about 50% of that increase relates to us taking more, absorbing more stranded costs. That's just natural. As a PLC, we've got uh, central costs that got um, smeared across a, a wider part of the group. Uh, and uh, last year, or, or, or 1920, we benefited in there from uh, provision release. So we, ongoing, we'd expect that number actually to be moving up uh, uh, and adjusted for any efficiencies that come through uh, in the corporate business. Um, in terms of uh, commodity uh, costs, there is indexation, as you know, uh, and indices that are used within 
uh, the uh, networks businesses uh, that uh, you know is, is something that we follow. They're not they're not exact kind of hedges, um, but at the moment uh, you know we're not seeing significant pressure coming through. Uh, but clearly, if commodity prices move up, uh, we'll see that and there may be a bit of a lag effect in terms of how we recover that. Okay. Yeah, and, and Mark, look, I, I think you've got a similar team here to the one you've had for a long time uh, in terms of discipline as well. Uh, we continue to strengthen our processes. Greg is doing yet more work on SOX light and, uh, and things like the Bayes report. So um, we had some pretty uh, good and robust discussions at the board there about how we're going to respond to all that. So I, th I think you can be assured that we'll be uh, uh, if anything, we'll be doing more work on strengthening processes, but you've got a set of people here who've got a similar mindset, um, and we're very, very focused on value um, uh, and driving value for shareholders. So hopefully that will give people some comfort. Th thank you very much. So this, so this left me thinking that I'm not so worried about the uh, costs going up for the, uh, for the wind farm, for the wind farms, but then what about stuff like the cost of the contractors, the cost of hiring ships, the cost of laying the cables and all this kind of stuff? I'm, you know, there is still some worry there. But then the worst thing, but then the worst thing is this 2.8 billion they've got to spend on their transmission and distribution network. With the price of copper doubling this to me is a, a real risk here and normally I'd, I'd kind of have gone with it you know i really was going to just go with these because of how they match up with my strategy so well but it's just that on top of the fact that they're so stretched already really does lead me to stick with my guns and stick with my gut feeling and so I'm still going to wait for the pain of this one before investing for the game. I think they'll be amazing for my portfolio is a high dividends utility stock. They hit both my main target areas for Greta Gold in terms of investing in wind power and investing in electrification. But this year, We've only just started the new regime of the Rio 2 price controls. So there's a risk that we're going to see a negative effect of that this year. And just that alone could be affecting a lot of their revenue, could be affecting a lot of their operating profit just from the Rio 2. Then there's the price of copper. And so this 7.5 billion spend that's very ambitious and that's stretching them to the limits that could, I'm worried, stretch them a bit too far and cause a bit of pain. Plus then actually doing these things, they've said it's going to cost 2.8 billion, but what could be the cost variance just in like people's wages and, you know, and unexpected environmental problems and whatever. And then um, also the same for the wind farms. You know, if everyone's building wind farms now, what about the price of hiring the rigs and stuff? And then there's always there's also the risk that there could be serious problem like you know there could be a storm or some disaster happens in one of the wind farms or they could be built a year or two late. So I think there's definitely a lot of potential for pain with this stock in the next few years. So I'm going to follow my gut feeling hold off, watch patiently, and I'm just hoping that things go well, but the market doesn't quite pick up on it, and then I can go in, or, or the pain starts affecting their share price, and then I'll find a good moment to invest when it looks to me that they're transitioning from the pain that the market doesn't seem to be anticipating and then maybe they will be the perfect way to invest into the UK's environmentalist future. 